hey guys, I'm Nashwa. Welcome back to my channel. And today I'm being joined by another booktuber, Bakhtavar. And she has her own booktube channel. She is also from Pakistan and we recently connected um, on Instagram, I think, and then from there to YouTube. So this is going to be another video in the series of collaborations that I'm doing. And I let Bakhtavar introduce herself. Hi guys, I'm Bakhtavar. I have a small booktube channel, very, very small compared to Nashwa's um, great channel. Um, it's called Book Bakht. And um, I started talking to Nashwa a, a few months ago, I think a couple of months ago, and we decided to do this collaborative video and I'm very happy that we did. So yeah, so stay tuned for some fun. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about Pakistani fiction. I dedicated the entire month of August to reading Pakistani fiction. And today we're going to talk about what we like about Pakistani fiction, what particularly doesn't work for us and the best and the worst um, of the books that we've read. And we'll also talk about some of the books that were excited to read. So the first question in a series of questions that we came up with um, is the fact that do our Pakistani authors write from experience? Because in my opinion, sometimes you read a book and it seems so far removed from the reality of this country. And you do wonder um, that if, the, if this is something genuine, if this is something that they've, they're writing from experience, or it's something that they've heard of, like they've heard of this terrorist incident in some far off part of the country and they decided to write a book about it. And I've observed this in a couple of books, but what do you think? Do you think that Pakistani writers write from experience? Uh, I think the Pakistani writers, first of all, let's tackle their sort of mindset, what I consider their mindset. I think they have, because obviously somebody who's writing in English is very unlikely to have, I don't know, close connections with the sort of things that they're writing about, which of course are important to write about. But I think they, because of obviously the way they're writing and everything, it's very unlikely that they've witnessed any of it firsthand, which makes um, people who are Pakistani, like you and me, it, it makes us kind of almost suspicious in a way, which I know uh, doesn't sound too great, but it kind of, um, it makes us think, do they really know what they're talking about? And of course, empathy uh, has, its, has its way into writing. It always does. But um, how far can it go? And it also, it needs to be handled very delicately because sometimes... Um, it becomes kind of, it's like you're almost, you know, I don't know, making a kind of, um, kind of a joke of it almost. And, and like, not in a satire, like satire is fine, but I mean, that, that's what I tend to think sometimes. I think that um, writers have done this and I'm going to take a name because we're going to name drop in this video. And before we actually get into the conversation, there's a couple of disclaimers that we should have mentioned in the beginning. But if you're watching this, we'll just tell you now that we're not experts on Pakistani fiction. At least I don't consider myself one. We're By no means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're people who read these books and then we're like, wait, that doesn't sound quite right. So if you're somehow offended by us taking names of authors, please don't be. We're not trying to offend anyone or we're not trying to make Pakistani writers or readers feel bad because I don't know how many people this will reach. But I feel like um, Bakhtawar has parrots if you can hear that. Us people. Um, he's got his opinion. <laughs> He's got his opinion. And I feel like people do get a little emotional when we talk about Pakistani fiction because they're like, you can't criticize. But actually, we can. And it's coming from a place of wanting something to get better rather than just hating on it. So we're not going to hate on any authors or any books. We're just trying to discuss this from a very um, literary perspective in a way that what really works in our fiction. So, yeah, and, and an analytical perspective as well, which is actually essential because that's what, I mean, not that we're necessarily literary critics, but I mean, that's a whole thing, you know, that that's a whole field actually. Yeah. So a couple of the authors that I feel like don't write from their experience, the first one that comes to mind, and this is Mohsen Hamid. Um, I recently finished The Reluctant Fundamentalist, like by recently, I mean yesterday, and it's 200 <laughs> pages and it took me 10 days. And normally like 200 pages just oh, okay. that long. And it's because he was writing about the whole 9-11 experience and everything. And he is talking about this in a way which is much, much far removed from the reality on the ground. So like, I feel like he's the kind of person that I'm a little suspicious about. And he has won literary prizes. So there's that element of, oh, he's writing this because he knows it's political and he knows this is what the literary prize is like. So in that like mindset, I feel like he's not writing from his experience, but he's writing from the perspective of what really works in the international community and the point of like, you know, impressing an audience, which is not necessarily their own. 
and it it sucks because then you feel like then they don't care about their own people like why are you not reflecting us and and you know uh, i saw an interview of mohsen hamid when where he was talking about the reluctant fundamentalist and i remember he said something like he saw a guy in a bar like a regular guy a muslim guy i think from the beard and everything and he said that guy was just looking at the screen where 911 was playing what are the chances but anyway uh, so and then the guy had like a strange smile on his face and that actually just s- sort of got the ball rolling for his novel he's like oh maybe i could create a character that uh, is happy that this has happened and that he's actually this really you know previously glamorous educated in america that sort of person and and, and you know what what if you convert that sort of person who actually isn't even from the tribal areas and has no such connections and then you turn that person to fun. i thought he's found that concept interesting but um it's it's executed poorly firstly and secondly a lot of it seems to be i hate to use the word borrowed but you know from the fall by albert kenyu which is also written in this sort of um conversational style where he has this unnamed stranger and he's telling him oh you know this is what happened this is the story of my life said so when i was reading it i'd actually read the fall um, no actually i'd read uh, the reluctant fundamentals a long time ago but when i read the fall um, like 6 months ago i was like oh my god did mohsen how much just um get this idea this um style maybe from so so that kind of um yeah, i felt that too and i felt it like because i haven't read the fall or any of the news work but i read a lot of like polonic and um i recently read don delilo's cosmopolis and in that like it does seem like an imitation of some of these like not a direct copy but like drawn heavily drawn inspiration from, heavily inspired true heavily inspired by people um and there's nothing wrong with being inspired but because the content seems orig- unoriginal and because the writing seems very distant so there's no connection between the writing and the story so one of those things has to work like it's either the writing that has to work for you or it has to be the storytelling so you recently read the runaways or you're reading it by fatma putto yeah yeah i'm uh, i'm i'm finished actually I, i i was reading it last night as well i had like a few pages left So yeah that that also um of course it has all of these um on the face of it really lovely themes you know sort of classism and then you know young people turning to fundamentalism when they really don't have a reason to and uh, one of the characters is this bbcd this british born confused they see if you will and then uh, the girl is is a christian girl who's always been ostracized by society and then the the third character is like um you know some really rich guy who's kind of spoiled and he's actually involved with uh, the girl that i just mentioned so obviously the the idea on the face of it is great but again the the execution is because obviously it's like some some 420 pages and it really it could easily have been 175 pages 200 and you she could still have made all the points that so it it kind of draws on without like there's i think maybe something like 30 40 pages in between in which these two guys are trudging across a desert and it's it's to no avail there, there's like there's no connection with it to anything and i'm like what what was this for was it just to fill up so um execution is a problem and then obviously it, i don't think she has ex- direct experience with any of these um particular characters so it's i mean she has tried to but again the the writing i had a problem with which was that the writing is too simple i know that's not a problem for a lot of people but sometimes when something is too simple it kind of it hurts <laughs> so uh it was like it's like it's too too simple and um you know i didn't i didn't like that as much so but just, i appreciate the themes the themes were nice i mean i suppose so just for a little bit of context um fatma bhutto is a very very famous writer in pakistan and most of the fame is because she comes from a very large political family so that's why we're discussing the fact that her content the things that she's writing about because i haven't read her but of course i have so i'm going to rely on her but i know mm-hmm. her political background her aunt used to be the prime minister of pakistan uh, a couple of decades ago and then she was assassinated so part of that is that you're coming from a huge political family and you're writing about things which again seem very far removed um from the kind of experiences that you're writing about so again i think that ties into our question of are they writing from experience but now we move on to the next part of this conversation that do you need to write from experience like do you need to live through things because writers can essentially write about anything like if you haven't experienced um war you don't have to write about war and i feel like they don't need that experience because look at all the fantasy writers and the sci-fi writers like they're writing they've never existed in those worlds but they've written about it and they've done really well 
So the question is, do they need the experience to write about these things or they just need to do more research? You know, I, uh, this brings something really interesting to mind because I remember reading somewhere, I think it was one of those the, uh, really silly articles that teach you how to write as if that's something you can learn. But um, it said something like, you know, you draw, you have a small experience. For example, um, you have a feeling of panic that you've lost your wallet, for example. So then when you're writing, you think about, you know, what if, what if I had lost my child? What if I had lost something infinitely more valuable? So the feeling that you actually did experience, you kind of keep elaborating it till it, it, it applies to things which are far more serious. And apparently that's a writing technique that's uh, very well known. But um, again, it has to be executed well. And I would mention the example of Babsi Sidwa because, you know, when she wrote The Bride, which, you know, we both read recently and you also discussed in your video, like, I'm pretty sure she's uh, never been adopted or lived in the mountains and, uh, you know, dunk bread and water and eaten it. And she, so it's, it's all observation, but you can see the really stark difference between what she writes and what uh, somebody like, for example, Fatma Bhutto writes or Mohsen Ahmed. There's a stark difference. Like she, um, she can sort of exercise her empathy to the extent that she can really imagine being those people uh, with their hopes and dreams and sufferings. And it's, it's very, very effective in her case, despite the fact that she doesn't have direct, I, I mean, I'm assuming she doesn't because she's not ethnically belonging to those groups. She's, I'm pretty sure, never lived in those areas also. So, you know, so, so apparently maybe a writer that has remarkable skill like that would actually fare better. So I think in some cases, like she's lived through them, because if you read Ice Candy Man or Cracking India, like she lived through the partition. She was yeah. the same age as the main character is in that book. So I feel like some of her writing definitely comes from experience. But what I'm trying to say is that you don't really have to live through that experience. And I think you agree when you mentioned that Babsi yeah. said you wrote The Bride, like she didn't really live through that lifestyle. She's not from the mountains and she just knows of it and how to write about it. So for her, I think both things work for her, that she's writing from experience, but she's also able to empathize. But there are writers who've written about things that they haven't lived through and they've done really well. And this brings the example of Cartography by Kamila sure. to my mind, because it's not one of my favorite books. I think it was considered a favorite of mine for a long time. And then I really read it and I'm like, okay, this has a lot of plot holes. This doesn't work for me. When I read it in my late 20s, I was like, no, this is not really working for me but she talks about the 1971 civil war which led to the creation of Bangladesh and she talks about it yeah. well and yesterday while we were discussing the preliminary discussion we actually checked when she was born and she was born after the creation of Bangladesh but she still talks about the ethnic the ethnicity of it the different and everything um, and she talks about it well so I think like you can writers can write about anything but they just have to have the kind of research ability to make the story Realizing. Yeah, to make the story sound more genuine. So now we're going to move on to the next part of our video, which is basically talking about our favorite Pakistani books. And if you had asked me six months ago to tell me about my favorite Pakistani books, I would not have been able to come up with an answer. <laughs> you would have had nothing to, nothing to say, radio silence. <laughs> yeah, radio silence because I hadn't read enough. But this year, because I'm trying to make more of an active effort to read like Pakistani books and then realize like which ones are good and which ones are bad. So I have like a list of books that I consider good and I consider like something that I would recommend to other people. Now the thing with recommendations is that I love recommending but I get so nervous when people actually tell me that they've picked it up and I'm like oh no I, do. I hope you don't hate me or I hope you don't end up disliking it. So yeah so like what are some of the best Pakistani books that you've read? Uh, I would have to say uh, The Prisoner by Omar Shahid Hamid because um, li like what we were discussing earlier he actually has um, a lot of experience with what he's writing because he writes primarily crime thrillers um, set sort of in Karachi and you know how political parties behave how the police obviously uh, behaves how crime is kind of organized and he I think he's been a police officer at a pretty good post for uh, possibly 20 years or something. So he he's not just familiar with, um, if I may call it that, the indigenous language of the streets, but he's also really, um, he's a keen observer of, you know, the intricacies of, of the, you know, the behavior of the criminals and the behavior of regular people, you know, in response and, and even people that aren't criminals, obviously. So it, the, his perception is so remarkable. I, I remember I read The Prisoner a few years ago and that was obviously his first book and also the first book I'd read of him because he'd written a couple by then. And I was, um, I'm, I'm not even somebody who likes crime thrillers actually, um, but 
he's he's quite remarkable. And then I went on to read The Party Worker, which is maybe his third book. And again, uh, it, it was it was quite nice. And I was like, you know, somebody who can draw you in when it's not even your favorite genre. And he can, you know, you almost feel like you're there with him. The the, the real, the dirt and grunge of the city and the, the, you know, the expressions on people's faces, what they look like before they shoot somebody. Dead. It's just so real the way he's done it. And that made me think, just like you said, that, it's it's because he's seen this day in and day out. But then again, he can add um, his own remarkable um, skill to it, really. Yeah, and that's an author that when you mentioned him, I have never heard of him. Like, I mean, I'm not very well versed in Pakistan fiction anyway. I just pick whatever I see in the bookstores. I go to the websites and I'm like, okay, this looks like it's Pakistani. So when you mentioned this author yesterday, I was like, oh, I should definitely check him out because I do like this genre. And I don't know if I've ever read a South Asian like crime thriller because most of our stories are based on certain themes some of them very political some of them like are very tragic and you always have this like heaviness when you're trying to pick up a Pakistani book because you're like I know this is going to make me like feel yeah. things it's going to either make me very angry or it's going to make me like partly traumatized so yeah. when you a crime thriller by a Pakistani author this is something that I'm definitely very interested in um, you yesterday mentioned a book of short stories that you really like. Yeah, I really liked uh, Daniel Muinuddin's um, In Other Rooms, Other Wonders, which I think I also reviewed on my channel. I, I thought it was really good because... I'm so sorry. <laughs> so um, anyway, so what I, f uh, what I really liked about his collection of short stories was that not only is the prose really, really sophisticated, but then again, he adds, again, the real feeling of authenticity to what he writes because um, his father actually was a feudal landowner. I think he's passed away now. And um, Daniel Muinuddin has taken over the, the farm, so to speak, from, from what I read. So uh, he, he really knows about um, the dynamics uh, in a way but he captures it beautifully and he kind of tends to focus on people that you wouldn't notice, you know, maybe um, not, not that anybody is a snob or anything, but, you know, sometimes one doesn't notice people that work for you or, you know, people that till the fields, you know, you never stop to think about what are they thinking about all day or, you know, the, the, the small, the shack type where they live and they've not got any electricity. We never stop to think in great detail of, of how they must be feeling, but he kind of captures it um, as, as if, you know, He's observed it at, at least in great detail. So I really, I, I, f I found it quite illuminating. And um, I, I think it's the only thing he's written. He wrote nothing afterwards, which if he would, I, I would read it, definitely. So I have had that book for a long time. I haven't read it yet. I was planning to read it, but like somehow short stories and I don't, like I find them harder to read. I prefer like a closely knit uh, narrative, not, not narrative fiction. So that's one book that um, now that you've mentioned that it's good, I'm definitely bumping it up on the books that I've wanted to read. So some of my favorite books um, are definitely like, I love Ice Candy Man or Cracking India by Babsi Sidwa. And I read it very recently. And I feel like Babsi Sidwa's books have been a steady, like they've been steady for me. They are different because uh, sometimes like, they talk about different things and different themes. Some of them are much funnier than the others, but like, I like them for different reasons. And because Cracking India talks about partition, I think it's a story that it has been taught to us in a way which was very political and it was biased in one way. Um, because like if you study here, then you hear a different story. But if you talk to someone from the other side, <laughs> I'm not trying to like um, create a political discussion here, but definitely the way that we're told our stories are very, very um, biased. So I really like tracking um, India and Babsi Silva's The Crow Eaters happens to be one of my um, favorite books because it's funnier, it's lighter in tone. And that's the first book that she wrote, which shows like an all Parsi cast. So she talks about her own community and she talks about her own people. So I really like that. And another book that I really liked, um, I read it a few years ago and it was called How It Happened by Shaza Fatima Heather. And it was a story that a lot of people criticized because it sounds like a Pakistani soap opera because it's about a family and a family drama and basically siblings getting married and our obsession with like the idea of marriage. But when I read it, I found it incredibly refreshing because that is something that I haven't seen in a lot of books. And that was what I want to see. So what if it sounds like a Pakistani soap opera? It's well written, it's executed well, it's funny and it's, it tells our story. It tells us exactly the way our society functions, marriages are a big deal, wedding preparations are a big deal. So when she talked about um, all of those aspects um, in the book, I really enjoyed that. 
And then it's a multi-generational book because um, the grandmother lives with them and the parents live with them and everyone lives in the same household. And that is such a foreign concept to most people who live in the West because you move out. Like you move out when you're 18 or you're 20 or after university, whenever you do. So you don't really live with your parents, let alone your grandparents. So in that- You never move out. Yeah, we, we don't move out. We, we live here. We live here with our parents and then we live with our husbands. So like, we never live on our own. So um, yeah. the thing with that was that the idea of multiple generations living together in the West is such, um, a, like, it's a concept that they, it's hard to understand because they don't do it. But in our society, it's very normal to have your grandmother or your, like, you know, grandfather live with you. And I thought that uh, portrayal in that book was very, very refreshing and I really like that. But another book that I read recently, um, it's called Greetings from Berry Park. And it's a memoir of a Pakistani journalist, not a Pakistani journalist, a Pakistani British journalist uh, who moved to the UK at the age of three. And um, he's basically been living there. So in his memoir, he struggles talking about religion and his identity because when he moved to the UK, his parents were like English, not Pakistani. And that is something that I found incredibly um, refreshing to read about in a way that I just thought it would be another one of those over-the-top memoirs, but he actually takes his time to explain the perspective of his parents. And again, I struggled to keep this book in one category. I wasn't sure if I should count it as a Pakistani book or as a British book. But in the entirety of the book, the author struggles with his identity, so I feel like it's completely fair for me to struggle a little bit with the idea that where, in which group or category uh, does it belong. So that was one that I read in this in the same week and i really really liked it been a real debate like do people that maybe have never lived here as such you know people like um hanif qureshi or mirza wahid people that moved away when they were um and also amir hussain uh, who I, I have a book of but i've never read him and, and they, these are people who've spent their entire life in another country um britain mostly and um they've maybe just visited a couple of times. So they, there's a real debate that do, do does their work and their experience count as uh, pakistani of course it counts as fiction and I'm sure it's uh, excellent quality but does it count as the Pakistani um, experience but I suppose maybe uh, it it does I guess in, in, in a certain maybe their experience uh, um, as a second generation immigrant or something I think it definitely you can't really say oh because you were born in another country or because like you're not from here um, in the sense that you didn't live and grow up here like you're not Pakistani that's not for us to say but whenever True. we're talking about even diasporic writers who most of Pakistani is like writers who were even we're reading today, like they live somewhere else. So they are Pakistani, but you know, it's that element of confusion you have. Another author that um, is very popular in Pakistan is Muhammad Hanif. And I think in our experiences, we've witnessed both the best and the worst from him. Um, I've read two of his books. The first one was A Case for Exploring Mangoes. And the other one was Our Lady of Alice Bhatti. And with me, one of the books didn't really work for me. Um, that was a case of exploring mangoes. I think I gave it two stars because I remember Buddy reading it with like um, Britta, who's a German booktuber a couple of years ago. And we were both like, it doesn't work for us because for me, that element of satire was a little bit crass. And I know people will say you're not smart enough to get it. And maybe I'm not, but like I'm allowed to criticize a book Absolutely. which I don't think works for me because, because for me, it felt very scattered. There was a lot of random things happening and I'm like, um, you know, that doesn't work for me. And in my opinion, and this is something that might come across a little bit sexist, but I feel like it's the kind of book that would appeal more to a male audience. So, okay. I think that is true. Yeah. So, a case of exploring mangoes didn't really work for me, but I recently read Alice Bhatti, and I really enjoyed that because um, it talks about the Christian minority in Pakistan, and that's something that is not reflected in our books. And then when I was researching him, he basically said that he's not interested in writing outside of Pakistan. He doesn't want to portray um, Pakistan for an international audience. He'll talk about his people for his own people. So yeah. that's something that I absolutely appreciated about him because like I disliked one very much and the other one I was like, okay, this is, I'm very impressed with how he handled a very sensitive debate because talking about minorities can become difficult. Uh, when I read the case for Explo uh, the case for exploding mangoes, so what happened was I think I read it at a time when I didn't mind so much that it was overly reliant on humor alone, because like you said, there are serious kind of sort of gaps in the plot and everything. But I, I think I didn't notice it at the time because it was making me laugh. So I was like, 
all right, this is fine. This is funny. Then there was a few clever bits in. So I, I did enjoy it. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't. And I, I really enjoyed it. But I think that was also uh, because of the context of my life, um, what was happening. And uh, I found it. And then I really liked... Um, Again, for its portrayal of the of the Christian minority, and um, you know the, the woman who um, the main character who's a nurse, and her father is um, you know I think he's a sweeper or something. So, um, but then I read uh, Red Birds because I thought that you know the first two were excellent. I bought Red Birds, and that actually gave me the um, the kind of idea to sort of begin my channel in a way because I remember that I searched for Red Birds on, on YouTube, which is like you know the second most important search engine after Google. And I found almost nothing. And I was like, why, why is there nothing? Is there like, you know, because for everything you, you want to review, right? I mean, in today's world anyway. So I didn't find anything. Um, and I respond sometimes better to a, like a video format. So anyway, I thought I was like, maybe, you know, maybe I should review books that everybody else seems to be ignoring, although it is a popular book. But then I read it, and I didn't like it at all. And I did a review on it. And it was it wasn't funny. So it didn't check the first box. It also again, uh, it had almost no plot, it, almost no plot, whatever plot there was, I think he covered it in the first 20 pages. And then the rest was just in in the wind. So, so I, that one was but I was planning to read it. But then I'm not sure because like, I think it looks like it's a mixture of um, both the first books, like A Case of Exploring Mangoes and Our Lady of Alice Petty. But I'm not sure if I'll pick this one up because like I, because I've read two of his books, I'm a little reluctant to step into one which doesn't really have a plot. And if it's, again, if it's not funny, that's like also taking away from it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're like, now that we've discussed the best and the worst, I think we know, we've discussed the best. We haven't gotten to the worst yet because, you know, we haven't really began the salty part of our conversation that um, we've discussed the best and we like, we like, I feel like now we can say that we have a lot of liking towards Pakistani fiction because there are people who have definitely done it really well. And there are people who appeal to the sensitivities of a local audience. So now we move on to the worst Pakistani books. And... You know, we, I don't, I, I thought we would have a lot more books to talk about. Like, I thought it would be like a 10 book list, but I'm yeah. very happy to see that, like, we don't really think that many books are bad. Like, True. they're sure they're off topic and some of them seem very distant, but like, when it comes to actually bad books, there's not that many of them. So, like, what are the, two, like, two or three books that you would consider, like, this is bad. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Uh, so recently I picked up the readings reprint of Meatless Days by Sara Soleri. Uh, I, I hadn't heard anything about it or anything. I was just, I think, more out of curiosity because, again, like you, I'd been looking to um, find the next um, grave. Oh, it's, it's, it's written a long time ago. The issue with that was that while, um, and I think I might actually be contradicting myself here because here I was looking for sophisticated prose, but then when the prose gets too sophisticated, that it's so verbose that I found it hard to digest any of her sentences. And I'm, I'm by no means kind of averse to that, averse to difficult language in any way. But it was like, I think there was this whole scene in which she was describing absolutely nothing. It was like somebody is laying a table and the dadi uh, of the, her grandmother for other for viewers um, is sitting down and she's looking at what's in the plates and everything and that was like four four pages or something of really 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 difficult prose and I was like what I mean like is is this worth the um, so that book I couldn't finish I couldn't bring myself to finish and um, so I didn't like that I mean I think that a lot of people especially uh, in Pakistan they sometimes um, because it's a fine balance it's it's a fine line that you have to walk sometimes. When something is so difficult that it's purposely so that it takes away from not only your understanding but also your enjoyment, I think that is that is a dangerous line to walk for a writer. And then if it's too simple, you sort of run the risk that um, more sophisticated readers won't relate to it and they won't like you as much. So I think it's a thin line to walk. But um, yeah. And other than that, um, if I was to think, I think um, obviously uh, how to get rich and uh, how to get. Filthy Rich in Rising Asia by Mohsen Hamid, which is, I believe, his third book, which uh, I have no reason why I bought. But uh, that one was really, really forgettable. All I remember is that there was something to do with an entrepreneur who makes um, bottled water. But it was, it was very terrible and kind of almost... Um, I couldn't sit through that one. No, I think I think the first two, if anybody is to try out Mohsen Hamid, I think they'd be much better off uh, reading Moth Smoke because I genuinely did like Moth Smoke and I, I've read it two or three times. I genuinely like it despite the fact that it's depressing because again, I don't run from the depressing dark bits uh, in human 
in the human condition, so to speak. So Mott Smoke is, uh, I believe, in my humble opinion, a masterpiece. But um, the, his third book, um, the one that I just mentioned, is is it, it's almost as if it's not even by the same person. I think I think he's by that time really under pressure or something to be liked or something by by Western audiences that it's it's. Um, I didn't didn't appreciate it as much. I don't think. I feel like. There's like two things that I kind of want to say that the first thing is like with the over verbosity of it, like the overworkedness of it, I've noticed it in so many books and it's almost like they've taken the SAT vocabulary and just thrown it into their Microsoft Word and then they make sentences around it that like, you know, the kind of, and it doesn't really help because to write a good book, in my opinion, again, like my opinion, but like you don't need to really use big words to impress an audience. <laughs> understand those words and if I'm especially if I'm reading like a physical book it's not like I'm reading on my Kindle where I stop and I look it up I'm very easy to look it up on Google like if I'm reading a book I'm not going to make the effort of picking up my phone and like looking up every Absolutely. word but I think it's also like using big words doesn't make um, writing exactly it doesn't make something high quality and about Moss and Hamid I agree with you that Moth Smoke is his best I read it a really long time ago and it still stands in my memory I didn't like it but I think it's his best because of how much I remember it. And it has like, it talks about the certain cultural um, rebellion that I think he's the one who's done it well. And after him, this trend of um, culturally rebellious books started where people are just like going out and drinking and like writing about it, which is not an issue, but write about it well, make it convincing. So okay. I do agree with you that if you have to check out Mohsin Hamid, um, Mod Smoke is the one to go in. Like you might end up loving it like a flower did or you might be like, this is memorable. It's not that great. So I also tried to read Exit West by Mohsin Hamid and I say try because I couldn't get through it. Mm -hmm. My experience of it was again, the over explaining, the over verbosity of it. Like there's sentences that span over pages. Like you start from the top, the sentence hasn't ended by the time the page is ended. So like, it's an attempt to um, use like really complicated, frustrating kind of language. And again, it won a prize. Um, and then sure, it worked for some people. But the people who I've seen reviews from and the people who I interact with, they're like, yeah, it was pretentious and it was intolerable. intolerable. So like Exit West is something that I tried and I was like, I, I don't get along with this writer. You know, that's often been on my mind. Um, you know, when you hear about all of these books, some of which are genuinely quite nice you hear about them uh, getting all of these literary prizes usually those aren't prizes in uh, the south asian context of things and i wonder about is 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 all this um the judging of the quality the literary quality of a south asian work is it done by people who actually have knowledge of south asian literature or is it done by somebody who says like oh there's terrorism there's a bit of violence there's other things which nobody wants to talk about maybe this has you know political or um other types of global um relevance and you know let's just give it a prize that, that that's a, that's what we need or is it you know are these prizes judged by people who belong to uh, Pakistan or you know even if you consider um, like any literature that comes out of Saudi but let's just consider Pakistani fiction is it like people who've lived in Pakistan who know the culture who can relate to it why is none of the um, this judging process done by any of them I, like I don't know enough to know who the judges are like I only sometimes follow the prizes but I don't I'm not like someone who follows literary prizes yeah. Um, so, but I do think like they're definitely not, I think there's a committee of people who are probably sitting and like trying to look up books to nominate. And often they're very topical, like Exit West got nominated and I think it won because it talked about like refugees and people like migrating to different parts and it has that element of like magical realism. But like it was a very current issue, like refugees and immigration is like a very current issue. And yesterday, I was, yeah. And yesterday I was watching um, Britta's video. Um, she basically follows literary prizes and she's reviewing um, all the books that have been nominated for the booker. And she was talking about a book that seems to be nominated because it ties in with the Black Lives Matter movement. But then she reviewed it and said that, oh, it, it's not done well. Like it's very clunky. It's not a good book, but it's nominated because you know it talks about a certain issue. So I think like with literary prizes, I'm not informed enough to know how they work, but I think they definitely look at the politics of it and, um, you know, like which one is more current. The books that I didn't like, because we had like a detailed discussion in the middle, I'm still going to talk about the books that I've hated because, you know, that's fun. Um, I recently read a book called This White Knight. 
and it's by a very young author who's very close to my age and it was supposed to be a mixture of the little women meets the virgin suicides but i haven't read the little women i'll get to it one day but growing up the virgin suicides was one of my favorite books because it was dark it was creepy and it was atmospheric and this book failed on so many levels because the whole premise is that the four sisters are supposed to be different and they're supposed to be um you know like very mysterious and what makes them mysterious like the author has so much to work with like give them interesting character characteristics but she uses the most basic things to make them different some of these sisters are different because they like to read books at weddings and they don't like social events and i'm like that just makes you an introvert <laughs> that doesn't really make you a mysterious creepy you know this thing so another thing that like the author also used suicide of a random character like who you know existed to move the story along and that is something i despise in books like why are you using a tragedy just to move the book along this is again an example of a book that hasn't been researched well because she also talks about the 1971 war which led to the creation of bangladesh but she talks about it from a very far away perspective and the thing is like if you want to move your plot along use something else come up with like a fictional war because it's fiction you can do that um but if you're talking about like uh, a 1971 war and you're not really considering the impact of it then like it doesn't seem like it's well executed and another issue that i've had with this book was that it was so poorly written that it could have used an editor and i'm not talking about sentences that needed to cut down like actual spelling mistakes and <laughs> grammatical errors and i don't know if i noticed those things because like i'm supposed to notice them i work for a company that makes me edit and you know edit and rewrite like contracts and proposals so like part of my job is to very critically look at documents and see where the mistake is so when i'm reading something like if a mistake pops up like i catch it immediately so i don't know if it's like my, or, <laughs> i don't know if it's like my overly critical like view of things or if it's like just something that was really badly written and not edited at all there were sentences which had missing words and i was like okay let's play a game and i'm going to like i used to take pictures on instagram and put it up like let's guess the missing word like because followed those instagram stories of yours they were really funny yeah because i think that was the only way that i could get through book uh, that book because it didn't really feel like i was reading it on my own like if i was making fun of it and other people were agreeing with how bad it was then it made me feel like i'm not overreacting and this is actually quite bad um another book that i talked about recently in another video was karachi you're killing me um it's supposed to be this like mid to late 20s journalist living her life as a journalist in karachi and again she's taken this tactic of like talking talking about the party lifestyle and the culture of drinking and everything and like in 250 pages however many long that book was like i don't care how much you're partying give me a plot line that's not why <laughs> that's not why i'm reading the book that's and this like i like you know i come across as someone who says like no don't drink like that's not what i'm trying to say i'm saying like you can explore that lifestyle for all i care like if you don't want to do it good for you but if you're into it like even more good for you like i'm not sitting here judging people and their lifestyle but again if you're putting it in my fiction and you're doing it so forcefully and you're not even doing it well like that's when i have a problem so like i'm not judging people they can live however they want to live but in fiction if you're like and it almost seems like again a distant distant perspective that she i don't know if she's lived through it or if she's experienced it but it came across as so incredibly over the top and when i watched like youtube reviews for this book i have not heard one person say that this is a good book because everybody is like pointing out like all she's focusing is on this culture of prohibition that we have and like why she's so obsessed um with like forcing this narrative down people throw either you're trying to convince people that like this is something that happens which we know but you're also like trying to shove this culture of like this party culture down people's throats and like honestly that's not why i read books like, i'm here for the story i think uh, a lot of writers have um, kind of taken up sensationalizing it a bit as well and kind of making it look like some hidden glamorous world a, a really disturbing trend that i've been noticing is that a lot of new books uh, none of which i've read but one uh, gets bombarded with them on social media and ads and stuff because now everybody is sponsoring their posts for no reason so the thing that i found really um well not disturbing but kind of uh, awkward is that people they keep putting uh, forward these words like 
look into the lifestyle of the elite and this is what happens like you said at parties and this is you know what happens when people drink alcohol and i'm like uh, i'm not even uh, like it's not even a more like you said not even a moralistic perspective but i'm like what what like there was there was one tagline in particular that i read um, i don't know if i sent it to you i think i sent it to somebody as, as a joke mind you and it was something like have a look into the lives of the elite uh, that was actually the byline for the novel I, i don't even remember which one it was and i was like what or is it like is it mutant x men mutant academy have a look at the, like like of course you would want to look but why is it like advertised like that i was uh, i found that very funny yeah i think so, it's just like um our cultural rebelliousness that like it shows that oh the state can do this 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 but look at us and it's like it doesn't make you like i don't know who needs to hear this but like it does not make it a good Book. Like I think publishers need to take notice. Of it doesn't it. make you cool. Or <laughs> like, and and definitely like the book, it takes away from the value of the book that if you're like capitalizing on these things. But like, it makes me happy that people realize that this is bad. Like for all the reviews that I've seen for Karachi, you're killing me. They're like, no, this is bad. Like this is actually bad. And I'm really glad that people recognize that. But it's just the writers and the publishers also have to say that this doesn't always work. So. now we move on to the last section of the video because we've been talking for a very long time um it's that pakistani books that we haven't read but we are excited to read so for me it's a book that i started reading it's called the light blue jumper and it's basically sci-fi and like i'm not a huge sci-fi fan per se but i do like books that are funny and satirical and also like a little bit out there and examples of that are the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy and like space opera by catherine m delante one of my favorite like sci-fi books because like it's just funny it's interesting and when i started reading this book it reminded me very heavily of space opera and that's something that i appreciated because it's sci-fi it's not grim and it's set away from earth so i'm about like 40 pages into that and that's one that i'm really really uh, it's away from earth really sold me <laughs> definitely definitely because Um, I watched an interview of the author, and she said that this is going to be a series, and that makes me really excited because, like, I like fantasy series in general, but I'm not a sci-fi fan. But if it's a Pakistani author who is talking about like sci-fi, and there's like book two coming out, then I'm like, oh, definitely, like, it's worth checking out. I was saying it seems like maybe she's the pioneer of sci-fi in Pakistani fiction because I don't, I don't, I mean, unless I'm wrong, I don't think anyone else has tackled this genre in in Pakistani fiction in English before. Yeah, so it's, it's really amazing. It might be our first. sort of fantasy sci-fi series yeah um, i think there's like definitely fantasy writers who keep writing about like our urban legends and our jinns and you know like that but sci-fi wise i you you might be right like i haven't seen a sci-fi book like i know of yeah. urdu literature yeah. tackling those elements because like i grew up reading umru ayar and like you know <laughs> those little tiny urdu novellas that you used to get so i feel like there's things that the urdu authors and that's a whole other like topic we're just talking about pakistani english um i think like they've explored a lot more topics than i've come across and i'm not very well versed in urdu literature at all so maybe that could be our next video where we talk about like what we need to learn about the urdu um the urdu literature but i feel like you might be right that something contemporary contemporary sci-fi might be the first um the first of its kind the other book that i'm excited to read it's called soul rivals and it's basically non fiction but it takes account into the it takes into account how sufi music has influenced our politics and i think that's a very very interesting perspective because i like like the element of sufi music in our own industry i like qawalis and it's interesting to see how like that music has influenced politics so it's a very short non fiction book that i'm excited I, i really want to pick that up that sounds like really right down my alley i really want to pick yeah. that up i think by nadeem farooq paracha um, who's also like a famous journalist and he's written like another book of essays called points of entry which i am also reading recently but now tell me about the books that you are excited to read well i recently bought uh, saints and charlatans which is also published by uh, mongrel press because uh, the light blue jumper is also um, a mongrel published book so i really want to read saints and charlatans i think it's written by a first time author but apparently it's gotten like stellar reviews i mean there's not been a video review i don't think but um whatever i read everybody said that it was very insightful and everything so i, I really want to i really want to pick that up i've actually bought it but um haven't read it yet Uh, other than that um i bought recently daddy's boy by shandana minas and i really want to pick that up as well um 
it, it's so weird. Like I, I was telling you this earlier that um, buying books and reading them are like two separate hobbies and everything. Yeah. That's really the case with me. I buy a lot of them, but the, the reading process is really slow and it's really, um, yeah. uh, I need to be better about it. I really need to. <laughs> so yeah, these two are the ones I'm excited about. No, I think it's very normal to like buy books because yesterday I thought like I did a huge unhaul and I was like, I'm not going to buy another book for the rest of the year. But then I went like, like my friend sent me books, like she sent me two fantasy books that I've been looking for. And then I went to Slate Book Bank, like the bookstore here. And I'm like, oh, I think I want some of these. So I feel like there are separate hobbies and like we shouldn't beat ourselves beat ourselves up. I was talking to Risha yesterday from The Love of Classics. And she's like, I'm on a book buying ban. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I was like, I hope this sticks because like readers, we know ourselves. <laughs> like we know, like we need to buy them if, even if we read them like. 10 years later. So I think this is our conversation for today. We talked about a lot of different elements of the Pakistani English fiction because we're not really tackling the Urdu fiction. I don't think we're qualified to do it yet. Once we start reading it, maybe then we can consider uh, making a video about it. So let me know if you guys enjoyed this video or if you would like to see Bakhtawar back on this channel. This video will go on her channel as well and we're going to upload it at the same time. So it's always interesting to film with like other people for sure, but definitely someone who's, who understands your perspective on Pakistani fiction. Um, because it's definitely one that's different from discussing Pakistani fiction with other people. Mm -hmm. So I will leave Bakhtawar's channel and her Instagram account linked below. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this little talk that we did. Um, let us know if you'd want us back on this platform. Although this is technically, Zoom is not a platform, but let us know if you'd want us to make more um, videos or discussions or anything like that. I will leave Nashwa's details um, because this is also going up on my channel. I leave her details, her channel link and everything in the description. And um, uh, thank you so much for sticking to the end and take care of yourselves. Goodbye.